Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dave Peterson. I'm the principal of Outside and Design Build, and I'll be walking you through some high-level discussion points when it comes to um, uh, detailing and sort of reviewing key points for from a fenestration design perspective for, in this case, um, commercial buildings. This is a part three building with sort of more of a focus on institutional um, application. So let's jump into this and, and just get a sense of high level what some of the things that you should be looking for when it comes to um, window and door design on such a building. So let's start with a discussion that realistically the fenestration or the window and door components of these types of buildings really are part of that enclosure design. And we really have to work in lockstep um, as a team when defining sort of performance because Administration performance certainly impacts the other opaque components of the enclosure um, and vice versa. So we're just separating this key component out, uh, typically again from a complexity and cost issue, uh, from a performance perspective, these are the poorest performing uh, links in uh, these types of buildings. And so it, it really sort of behooves us to sort of talk a bit about sort of that balance point and understanding that there are sort of key connections um, specific to installation, we'll talk about that in a second. That are going to be really important that we do um, sort of look at a holistic uh, view of, of the building in, in terms of what we're trying to achieve. So the first context is understanding sort of where we're building this, um, specific to climate zone. In southern Ontario, we'd be looking at a combination of climate zone five in southern Ontario, climate zone six, uh, further towards the sort of central portions of Ontario, um, and understanding really the impact of sort of that heating biased climate on buildings um, and also on window and door specifications. And this is a graph that kind of helps combine the window to wall ratio, uh, the lower access detailing here, with sort of the effective overall, or the potential for the effective overall R value of the entire building system. Assuming again, uh, certain key uh, basis points, um, such as SB10, that sort of looks at an effective R20 uh, enclosure. Now this is a challenging thing to achieve, especially when we take into account thermal bridging. But it'll give you a sense of the importance of really sort of getting a balanced one to wall ratio up front. And we see very quickly that if we're above 40% in our climate zones five or six here in Ontario, that really what we're doing with the opaque elements of the wall means very little. The window performance is so poor in comparison that we're really sort of dragging down the overall effective performance of the building system. Um, as we might imagine these highly glazed um, commercial and, and multi-unit residential buildings in the city of Toronto um, with curtain wall or window wall systems are typically performing it's sort of between an R2 and an R4 which is um, substantially poor. Um, codes like the Toronto Green Standard or step codes are helping push us beyond typical building code but that being said getting up into some of these areas here this high performance um, uh, enclosure line pushes us to you know an equivalent R4 window performance uh, up to sort of passive house levels of performance. And, and these window systems are still substantially expensive, um, difficult to find as well for larger commercial projects. So um, this is sort of where we need to be. This is kind of where we're performing now. And we have really a few short years to be able to push the needle to be able to achieve these components. Um, a couple of sort of basis uh, or basic um, uh, ways of looking at fenestration versus um, the wall systems are that we look at effective U value performance, not um, a nominal or effective R value. Um, these are tested assemblies, looking at sort of center of glass, U value, edge of glass, and frame components that are area weighted into a tested assembly number. So when we start talking about windows, it's always going to be in U value. It can be in BTU per hour per square foot. It can also be in the metric equivalent watts per meter squared Kelvin. Um, so both ways of, of looking at the same thing but being able to consistently then compare different systems because we're looking at sort of a single value to do so. The next thing I would be looking for is the, the massing of the building, the orientation specifically of the windows and the balance of window to wall ratio. So we can assume we have a point tower with equal window to wall ratios on all quadrants. We may also have a bar building or an L-shaped building that has a very different um, detail in terms of percentage of glazing, specifically to the orientation. Um, that's located on the building. And this can create some challenges and also some opportunities. So when we look at this, we look at sort of the potential, ideally for passive solar heating, that's focusing on the south elevation of the building, allowing that sort of consistent sun path and sun angle in the winter months, the lower sun angle to actually be harvested and provide us with some uh, positive benefits in terms of, of heating, uh, reducing our natural gas consumption 
and looking again at the solar um, exposure in southern Ontario, we do have excellent solar exposure. So if we design accordingly, it works really well. The caveat there being that we need to make sure that in the summer months, at the higher angle of sun, that 71 degree summer sun angle in Ontario, that we're rejecting heat gains because the glazing we're using to allow heat gain in will allow excessive gains in the summer months if we don't have uh, shading. We'll talk about shading in a second. Ideally, though, if we're looking to um, uh, sort of work with passive systems, we'd like to have our wide flanks facing north and south, our narrow axis of the buildings facing east and west. That east and west sun, that rising sun on the east and the lower sun on the west can create some challenges in terms of not just glare, but certainly overheating on the west facade of buildings um, in our climate zones. Um, and there's some tools that we can use, including selective low E coatings on an elevation specific basis to ensure that we have the potential for harvesting passive gains while rejecting um, or passively reducing the amount of excess of solar gains on the east and west. So we have some tools here that can be fairly low cost. Um, and with the use of energy modeling um, and CFD analysis, we can very quickly determine if, um, if this is low hanging fruit in terms of looking at our system design. For us to sort of understand that again, this is sort of a, a bit of a detail from what I just mentioned here, that higher summer sun angle, if we have a building integrated component, this could be a facade detail or an added uh, shading device. We can ensure that in the summer months, we're not having excessive gains, that lower angle of sun comes in. Mechanical systems designed to take that um, uh, energy coming in from the sun and distribute it through the balance of the building it can be very effective tools when we're looking at passive solar design. The challenge being if we don't get this right, we have some challenges, I think, in terms of the comfort levels, and certainly the energy performance as well, but the occupant comfort is something that we really have to take into account. Um, you know, energy use is certainly one thing. Um, durability would be the other. We'll talk a bit about that in terms of designing or, or creating better uh, products that are gonna resist things like condensation in our climate. So these are important, not just from the standpoint of durability of materials, but also from an indoor environmental quality perspective that we're not uh, creating challenges with things like mold and mildew um, based on um, liquid water condensing on these surfaces. So we have to sort of really balance um, the energy performance with durability, uh, maintenance intensivity, first cost. There's a lot of things coming to play here. Um, if we don't get this right, and we have this sort of summer sun coming in and creating an excessive um, heating situation in the solar gain, it may look like this. And very often the occupants of these spaces really only have one sort of tool at their disposal and that's to use an interior blind designed for uh, privacy typically to reduce the amount of heat gain. Um, and that can be somewhat effective for radiant gains, but not for convective gains. Here's a CFD analysis quickly showing how that um, air is heated, becomes more buoyant, stratifies, fills the room with warm air. We've lost views. We've lost connectivity to daylighting potential as well with the blinds in the down position. We still have this excessive heat gain and discomfort associated with that, that now a mechanical solution is taken care of. So blazing specifications, the low emissivity coatings, um, as part of these systems allow us to reject or allow heat gain. Um, and we can balance those based on orientation and the specific requirements of the project. Let's take a look at sort of the weakest links and work our way through to the glazing design. This is a, an approach that I like to take simply because it really balances what we're doing with the window products. Typically, again, we're looking at different frames with different glazing specifications that are then combined into a tested assembly. Um, these can be pretty eff effective if we've got the balance right, but there's a lot of variables here. So understanding how energy wants to sort of flow through these assemblies can help us to focus on key areas or critical components that allow us to um, really sort of define improvements there that impact the overall performance of the window and door system. As an example here, we have a, a therm diagram um, in pretty typical winter nighttime test conditions. This is using an NFRC 100 uh, path to be able to compare products. We quickly see sort of when it's minus 18 C out plus 21 degrees C in, how these key components of a window system perform when we do this engineering analysis. Um, the sight line, the weakest link of the window system, kind of where my cursor is hovering right here through the spacer assembly is the coldest point. It's barely above freezing in these conditions on a typical SB10 compliant uh, window wall system. 
um, with high performance glazing. So again, if we focus strictly on glazing without understanding the challenges here of the sight line and frame components, we often miss the fact here that it's not just uncomfortable, but there's durability issues here. If we have, let's say, greater than 50% RH in these suites, um, we're gonna see liquid water condensing in these areas and spilling over onto finishes, um, creating other problems. So understanding sort of how we can enhance these areas, things like looking at our frame design, and enhancing the thermal breaks within the frame. So from a small half inch um, UPVC thermal break through to maybe a larger polyamide thermal break or cellular PVC breaks, you can see these are getting substantially larger as we get into lower and lower frame U values. And when combined with the right glazing, this approach is gonna give us an overall very low window or door U value. It's gonna give us an excellent condensation resistance factor or what's called an I index in Canada. Um, and, and these are helpful in terms of balancing not just the comfort or energy performance, but also looking at sort of life cycle and components there. So as we get into more and more stringent code requirements, as we're push, pushing by sort of 2028, 2030 to net zero ready for these buildings, we're going to start to see these products with these sort of specific section details that are going to help us as, again, a key part of that building enclosure uh, to get there. Um, the other discussion that we really can't sort of leave out of this is resilience. What happens if we have a power outage in the winter or in the summer months? And is the fenestration design going to actually help us increase the resilience of that building, the ability for tenants to shelter in place? Or conversely, and we see this in many um, older buildings in Toronto, will they have to leave that building very soon after the power outage and, and find another place to shelter? because the uh, temperature conditions have either gotten too cold or far too warm in a very short period of time. And generally speaking, we're looking at sort of 72 hour resilience, although there are third party standards looking at resilience um, levels up to two weeks after a power outage. So um, an interesting sort of uh, extra fact to consider when we're looking at fenestration design. We talked about the sight line being the weakest link, and so enhancing certain key components within the window system can actually help us generate a, a, a lower U value um, and again, greater durability. Things like the spacer bar, which is a small component that separates the IG or triple glazed units, um, is another area where we lose energy through um, conductive loss. And moving away from highly conductive metals such as aluminum and galvanized steel into stainless steel is a way the industry has sort of created um, a positive input in terms of not just sort of that temperature of the sight line, but also the durability of the units themselves. And, you know, the next step would be to move away from metal altogether, in this case, stainless steel, and moving into non-metal um, alternatives or equivalents. And there's several players on the market now that have been doing this for quite some time, are reimagining their products to work with the higher design pressures of commercial spaces or larger buildings, taller buildings specifically, with higher design pressures. And these components can really help us, again, further reduce these conductive losses at this weak point and create both comfort and durability. Um, again, you know, increments of 5 degrees C from the uh, aluminum product through stainless steel and into the non-metal products can be achieved. Um, within the other types of losses we may find, convective losses are something that are really sort of relegated to the sealed unit assembly. This movement of air that sort of robs us of, of insulating value. Um, using inert gases, air is quite light, it convects rather easily, moving to argon, krypton, or in extreme cases, xenon, at a much higher density than air, will resist this convective looping and actually um, maintain our, our center of glass U values um, in more extreme conditions. Um, there are certainly first costs attached to removing air and, and injecting sort of argon, krypton, or xenon, argon being the standard of the in, uh, within the industry very cost effective and, and pretty effective in terms of what it does. Krypton and Xenon are, are um, quite a bit more expensive in terms of the lifting that they do in this case. Um, the other thing that we might do from a design perspective, once we've looked at thermally improving our frames and our sight lines, are looking at sort of how we design with structural mullions. And very often, again, structural mullions will separate operating glazing from fixed glazing. That's really sort of their intent. There's obviously a frame, a perimeter frame that connects to the building um, envelope. These are key considerations. We can't really remove those. But one of the things that we shouldn't do is design with structural mullions in terms of the aesthetics of a building. We can certainly enhance the design. We can connect to other op um, opaque components with our uh, 
um, structural framing both vertically and horizontally. But we have implications here very similar to the implications of, of what balconies do, especially if they're not thermally debridged. Um, similar to sort of the cooling uh, fins on a air-cooled engine, we're really doing this with our mullions as well, and we're enhancing the energy flow because these are the weak links. If we can have more glazed area and remove structural mullions where necessary, as long as we can still meet design pressure and, and, and these structural loads, um, this can overall improve the efficiency of both windows and doors. It can also help us reduce first cost. So there's some uh, general benefits if we can design simply, um, use other building components to enhance the aesthetics not the structural components. And this is an example here of a typical multi-unit residential building with a very simple layout that's both effective in terms of providing light, views, operable fenestration, yet we've minimized the amount of structural mullions fairly substantially. And so this is a great design. The one above might look interesting, um, not quite so thermally efficient. Understanding glazing, this is the other sort of component is radiant loss uh, and gain. And with low emissivity coatings, which are basically metal oxides that are layered onto the glass components, we can really impact the way that we perform in terms of um, radiant gains and losses. What's interesting is that this generation of what are called clear low E or sputtered low E coatings are very thin. They're very impactful in terms of allowing lots of visible light to come through, color rendering, there's about a delta of less than 10% in terms of visible light transmission between clear glass and even a low solar gain product. Um, this is an excellent tool for us to use in terms of really connecting people inside the buildings with outside, allowing for proper daylighting. Within the key spectrum, which is the infrared spectrum that we're dealing with with these coatings, we can further fine tune the way that performance is, is, um, is typically detailed by looking at the near infrared and far infrared. We can quantify these as solar heat gain coefficient on the near infrared side, emissivity on the far. Emissivity is the ability for these products to redirect radiant losses by reflecting them off of these, these metal oxides back into the room. All of these products here are very low emissivity, which is basically the, the you know a low what a low E coating does and is. Where we can fine tune their performance is again within that solar heat gain spectrum. We can allow more solar energy in from a passive perspective. We can balance what comes in versus what we um, um, potentially reject using a mid-gain product. And low-gain products are pretty impactful in terms of especially Western facades where we have potential for a lot of heat soak or for glare um, uh, to occur. These can reject up to 80% of that solar heat before it gets into that space and requires a mechanical solution to deal with. So our glazing specification is really important, not just from an aesthetic perspective, but certainly in terms of the energy performance um, that it provides us with, both in summer conditions regarding solar heat gain, as well as the emissivity of the unit, the ability for it to reject losses, um, you know, in, in the colder seasons. So very impactful. Um, residential in appearance, that's the other thing. Clear low ease are really designed for us to see through and for us to sort of experience the outdoors still and connect, um, yet they're still very impactful in terms of how they perform from an energy perspective. There are different types of glazings that we can look at as well, depending on if we're looking at vision glass, something that's connecting us to spaces and views versus daylight glazing. And we can look at a very specific type of daylight glazing called diffuse glazing. And I would refer to this as not fritted or um, etched or sandblasted glass, which is a two-dimensionally diffuse glazing. We're talking about these are products that have fiberglass veils or cells within them that three-dimensionally diffuse light. So these would be typically used outside of the vision glass area, outside of the human space that we're connecting to with views and color. And we would use these in clear story windows, in rooftop monitors, potentially in skylight systems. It could be in a combination with diffuse light and vision glazing as well, depending on the application. And these are really impactful at helping reduce lighting power densities, creating very clear, almost like a north quality of lighting, driving it deeper into the floor plate. Here we're not utilizing things like light shelves in and out. Um, this glazing is actually helping harvest that light and using lighter emitting surfaces to drive it deeper into the floor plate and create a very natural, um, sort of healthy lighting that sort of really connects to the occupants in that space without uh, obviously the cost of, um, of looking at electrical lighting. And this is used often in conjunction with 
daylight sensors as part of the electrical lighting system to allow us to shut those units off, especially at the perimeter of, of um, buildings, when we have excellent access to natural lighting. So some really neat things to look at there. Uh, many of these are further enhanced with certain aerogels or insulating materials to give us a better than uh, clear glass insulating value. Um, values up to sort of R18, R17 are certainly possible center of glass based on proprietary systems that utilize diffuse glazing. The next step really is to look at sort of active glazing versus passive glazing systems. The last two, low emit, uh, emissivity coatings and um, diffuse glazing are considered passive systems. Active systems and electro electrochromic glazing is one active system that utilizes a, a, an energy input to change the state of tint, which impacts our solar heat gain coefficients and our visible light transmission percentages. And these systems are typically combined to build the integrated sensors as well as um, sun path sensors to pre-tint um, and sort of react to what's happening tactically that day. Um, so these are really needed. This is sort of a switchable low E is how I would maybe um, quantify it. And I really do think that these are the future of, of high performance design in terms of being able to, first of all, sort of manage that sun path, manage the glare, manage the solar heat gain. Um, these, of course, are also overridable by the occupants. And so we as, as um, occupants of these spaces can control them as well. And I think control is an important factor. Some systems are passive. We maybe can't control them as actively. These systems certainly can be overridden as well. And there's a couple of key players with second generation companies coming in. We're getting close to room darkening now with these products. So some really interesting things that are happening in the, in the marketplace. Um, we're now starting to bridge the gap between high performance glazing and fenestration and high performance mechanical systems. And some of these companies have done some really neat um, uh, white paper collaboration with um, companies doing uh, geo exchange, as an example, to showcase that the combination of um, switchable glazing and a geo exchange system can be a very, very impactful and effective low energy building solution. So we're really starting to understand how these things inter interact and how they work together to create um, better buildings. The controllability factor doesn't stop there. We can still look at sort of passive approaches. Uh, daylighting design is certainly a passive approach. Ventilation as well. We can now override the mechanical system or turn it off if, in fact, we can open a window or door system and actually get fresh air and, and free cooling that way. Um, certainly some challenges in terms of how we do that. The type of operators, the location of those operators are key. Um, the challenge of, of course, building in densified environments are that when we open a window or door, that we also have associated noise coming in with that. And so there are some, solu uh, some solutions like trickle vents uh, and sound attenuated um, passive vent systems that allow us to sort of get some air without the associated noise connected to that airflow. And so we're starting to see these being applied more and more as we get into sort of these taller and, and sort of um, uh, you know, towers that we see in the city of Toronto are being built on existing properties. Um, daylight design, as mentioned earlier, with diffuse glazing can be done with vision glazing as well. We have to balance the amount of light in with things like glare. We want to ensure that we don't bring in too much visible light because then we have a challenge. Again, our eyes can't deal with that contrast. And now we have a, another challenge altogether. And so again, external and internal um, fixed components or even variable components can help us harvest this daylight. Um, these can be quite impactful. Um, again, understanding though that we don't create glare and hot spots and, and how this might work um, are important considerations. So it's not just as simple as saying, we have a window exposed to sunlight, we can reduce our lighting power densities. There's a whole series of um, sort of uh, designs and details that have to come together with your uh, lighting specialist to ensure that this is going to be an effective tool. Sound attenuation, we talked about that again with flanking uh, paths and sort of uh, opening windows, we have this. Now, the challenge, of course, is even when our windows are closed, we have the challenge of these densified environments. And as we build in them, as we build closer to railway corridors or uh, heavy transport corridors, um, this can be a huge quality of life issue for people, especially in multi-unit residential buildings. Um, glazing design can certainly help and assist with that. We can do things like um, increase airspace thickness, vary glazing thickness, add laminated lights to change the way sound moves through these solid assemblies. And these can be very impactful. 
especially if we're building on rail corridors or highways where we have low frequency noise. Again, there's different approaches for low frequency uh, noise. This is not typical of STC, although I, I'm noting it here. We would focus more on OITC, which is outside in transmission class. These are lower frequency sounds and they're harder to attenuate through these um, objects. So if we're looking at sort of reducing that train or heavy truck noise or construction noise, um, we want to focus on OITC in lieu of. The other component here is we have to look at how we install because we can have flanking paths. We can do an excellent job on specifying the right glazing and an airtight window system. If it's not installed correctly, we'll have these flanking paths for air, for moisture, um, for, um, for sound. And so installation detailing, we're really starting to get a better sense of, again, how we fit within wall assemblies. Um, Passive House has kind of led the way in terms of aligning key thermal planes, the center of glass and a window with the key plane of thermal continuity within the wall. Looking at thermal bridges and reducing those or dealing with them either from a design perspective or from a material perspective are another approach that we could take to further enhance it, um, the overall combination. We can go to great lengths to specify excellent windows and doors, but if we in install them improperly or use materials that, that, that sort of thermally flank what we're doing here with these designs, we've kind of shot ourselves in the foot. We really want to make sure that we're balanced with the other components of the enclosure and that those control layers for air, vapor, um, uh, water, and for thermal control are properly aligned um, using sort of a, a SI approach, um, again, a page out of the Passive House um, handbook to balance everything. Um, this includes then water management, which is going to be key, uh, maintenance, longevity, all these other components can be impacted by doing this the right way up front, or if we do it the wrong way, we may see premature aging of components, materials. We might have to see actually a replacement taking place because of, let's say, water ingress or damage. Um, and then we've really sort of shot ourselves in the foot in terms of the carbon footprint, the life cycle opportunity here. We might be short circuiting that. Uh, obviously, cost is, is going to play a factor as well. So getting this right really means looking you know, at all of these key components, working with other professionals on the opaque enclosure and ensuring that and we're connecting the dots here with all of these elements that everything is thought out, is optimized, ideally modeled up front, and even more ideally tested, um, you know, for air and water penetration um, uh, after the fact or, or during a mock-up or at the beginning of an installation to ensure that what we've designed is actually the condition that we're going to experience um, within these builds. So that's sort of it for a very, very quick sort of walk around the block. When it comes to Windows 101, uh, I'm sure this workshop is going to open up a lot of other opportunities for discussion, and uh, I look forward to, uh, to being part of that.